Hello everybody, welcome to the first and almost certainly only video on my 2010 Renault Megane RS250 Cup. I acquired this car about two months ago at the time of filming and I drove all the way to Sweden to get it. However, since the car arrived back home I have done the sum total of about 50 miles in it I haven't even seen it for four weeks and with any luck on Saturday its new owner Christian is coming to collect it. So what went wrong? Today's video is going to be a bit of a special. It's going to be part story, part review of this car because this is an absolutely incredible machine for many, many reasons. However, if you're not interested in the backstory, you're going to want to skip ahead. And in fact, I would suggest that you pick up the story at about this time. If you're still with me, that means you want a bit of a story. Well, thank you for keeping with me. Here's what happened. I had my supercharged E92 BMW M3 up for sale for a little while. If you're in the UK at the moment and you're trying to either buy or sell a car, you'll know the fact that the car market is currently uh, in trouble basically. I had a huge amount of people being very interested in the car but very few that seemed willing to commit. And then a chap by the name of Mark came along and said, oh I'm very interested in your M3 but unfortunately I've got my own car that I need to get rid of. So I asked him what he had because I was quite happy to take a, a car in part exchange and then sell said car on. And he showed me pictures of this. His very special RS250 on which he has spent an awful lot of time and money but he wanted to upgrade to something uh, quote unquote more serious. I looked at the car and thought yeah that looks pretty decent and after chatting with him for quite a while it became very clear that Mark was a, a very serious guy that looked after his car and had spent an awful lot of time and money making it pretty decent. He was asking a fair price as part exchange and so I thought yeah, why not? One catch. He lives in the middle of Sweden as a British expat. But that wasn't really a problem. I thought, you know what, that's an opportunity for another adventure. Unfortunately, on the way home things started to go a little bit wrong. In a few moments I'm going to talk you through this car's ludicrous specification. However, one piece of it had been installed but not yet track tested and that was a new front splitter. It is basically as you see it now, however it did not have the struts on it. So when I got onto the Autobahn Naturally, I wanted the car to be able to stretch its legs just a little, and so it did. And I got to about 130 mile an hour, and then this almighty racket came from the front of the car. Long story short, it turned out that that splitter at the front really was generating serious downforce, because what it had done was basically tried to rip the front bumper off. You see, it was bolted very, very securely to said bumper. However, the bumper it was bolted to is only really attached by a series of small plastic trim clips. They are not designed to have such a force pressing upon them. It's basically like me trying to stand on the end of the thing. It's just not going to cope. That left me, rather unhappy, stranded at the side of the autobahn. Not a fun place to stop, I can tell you. Being a bit confused, annoyed and frustrated. The solution that I came up with, with a ferry to catch and very little time to spare, was to try and find the nearest DIY store in Germany and not knowing what their Halfords equivalent is called, we just made a bit of an educated guess. Fortunately this place had cable ties and so I simply cable tied the front end of the car back together. I then got home, I got in touch with Mark, the guy that sold me the car, who I must say was totally mortified. Mark really really cares for this car and he felt awfully bad about the whole thing so I cannot praise him enough for the way that he dealt with everything. We agreed that the best thing to do would be to put a completely different splitter on the front which is one made by Proline who apparently are 
quite well known in the Renault world and various other things and their splitter design looked the best because it was attached nicely and neatly and properly. Unfortunately, Proline then turned out to be total charlatans. At the time of filming, they still have my £300 having failed to deliver a splitter for over a month and now having failed to return me my money for over a week. So if you're currently thinking of buying anything with them, I am afraid I cannot give them my recommendation. Instead, we chose to try and repair the original splitter because the design itself wasn't fundamentally flawed, it was just attached incorrectly. And so uh, my friend Sean down at Essex Auto Sport in Kelverdon sorted it out for me and got it looking right and, and, and got it working. Proline faffing around meant that I was without even access to the car for over a month, which upset me greatly. My plan was never to keep this car for very long, however I did want to at least try and enjoy it just a little bit before it got sold. Sadly, that was not to be. And so it's literally only yesterday that I have finally managed to go and pick this car up. Today I am filming my review with it. I am putting some fuel in it for its new owner. I've had it cleaned and then it will simply sit on my driveway until it is gone. I took the money that I used from the M3 sale to buy the S2000, which you'll have already seen on the channel. And the money I get from this is going to go towards making the Celica right, because I know that everybody wants to see the Celica back on the channel, and also buying a replacement for the Mercedes, because I've been really enjoying that, but I also want to upgrade that and finally make myself a nice Holy Trinity driveway again. So, enough backstory, let's talk about the car. This started life as a fairly plain and ordinary 2010 RS250 Cup. If you're not into your Renault Sport Megans, as, as I'm not, this is the one that's based on the third generation Megane. I often get in trouble with Megane forum places because I call this the second generation Renault Sport because it is only the second Renault Sport that they made, but it's based off of the third generation Megane. Basically, the 250, the 265 and the 275 are all more or less the same body shell. This car has undergone a very, very significant transformation, which I suspect is probably obvious by the cage, the noise it's making and the way that it looks. As I can't really memorize what's been done to this car, let me give you a little bit of a rundown from the outside. KTEC Racing Hybrid Stage 2 Turbo, Wagner Intercooler, HKS Blower Valve, 630cc Injectors, an ITG Maxigen Induction Kit, a KFL Gearbox Mount, a Vibrotechnics Dogbo Mount, a full custom exhaust from the manifold back. There's been an extensive weight saving program including carbon fibre everywhere, fiberglass doors, a custom fibre tailgate, ultra lightweight battery, polycarbonate windows, the removal of all the sound insulation, carbon fiber wing mirrors and much much more. Aero is taken care of courtesy of a completely custom front splitter and rear diffuser with canards taken from an S15 imported directly from Japan. The rear wing is a hybrid made up of parts from a Clio, Megane 275 and the Megane V6 race car. The interior has a 6 point lightweight cage weighing only 16 kilograms, Recaro seats, 4 point harnesses, a Momo steering wheel and a CAE shifter to complete the look. Handling is taken care of courtesy of a set of RSC Competition Pro dampers, high quality items made in Switzerland, performance friction discs, OZ ultra lightweight wheels and a whole heap of other parts, the full list in the description below. comprehensive isn't it? Now the result of all of that work is a pretty impressive headline figure of 350 horsepower with 350 pound foot of torque and a wet weight of 1188 kilos with half a tank of fuel. The car was set up by the world famous Raider Motorsport people and it's been designed to get one 75 kilo person around the Nürburgring as quickly as humanly possible. What's particularly interesting about the build is the fact that the engine apparently on its first run was making quite a bit more power and torque than it currently is. About 370 horsepower and over 440 pound-foot of torque. 
Those figures were deliberately pulled back in the interest of longevity for both the engine and the gearbox. One thing that is particularly stunning about this car is the history folder. I have never in my life seen a history folder quite so comprehensive and complete as this one. Mark has spent, by my own estimations, in excess of £30,000 building this, and that is not including the original purchase price of the car. He called it his therapy dog. It's also sometimes been called Pops, and that man's love is very evident in the way that this thing has been put together. This is not your average kind of just strip everything out, scrape the inside and chuck all the stuff in the bin kind of build. The attention to detail is absolutely stunning. Now from inside, the first thing that you notice is the fact that it's quite noisy. I would never have built a car like this for a number of different reasons. I've often wondered about putting carbon fiber or fiberglass doors on a car and having now experienced this one, I would never ever consider it again. It makes the thing ridiculously noisy and also at about 130 mile an hour you can see daylight through the top of the door because it's trying to open itself. That is somewhat terrifying. After the M3 it also sounds pretty uh, pretty disappointing in here to be honest. The engine is functional at best but in fairness the BMW's V8 is an absolute masterpiece and one of the best sounding engines of all time. Particular highlights for me also include these Recaro seats which are absolutely perfect. The harnesses actually work quite well although they are a total faff to get set up and this Momo wheel is an absolute joy. I love cars with small steering wheels, having had an Elise, the wheel in my Evora was quite small, and various other things. The, the little bits of carbon covering everything up, and even the little plate down here displaying this is an RS350 is such a nice little touch. Bit cheesy perhaps, but really wonderful nonetheless. Things I really don't like include the cage. The cage itself is very, very good. It's a super lightweight cage, very impressively built, bolt-in job, six-point, proper thing, and with these doors, it's very necessary. Originally, this car did not have any adjustment at all on this seat. This is fixed in place. I've now had runners put in for its next owner so that they can share the car with their friends and whatnot and it just makes life a little bit easier. It's also raised the seat a little bit, which did make life a bit better for me because as it was, I'm normally a big fan of sitting as low in a car as is humanly possible, but with this thing, the dash is so high, you, you couldn't see. You just could not see out of it. So that was something that was uh, a bit annoying and very difficult, you know, getting used to the car and trying to navigate it down a narrow road like this or through a tight city. You've absolutely no idea where the car is and it was actually really intimidating to drive for, for a small little hatchback, which it shouldn't be. The M3 was easier to place on a road like this, and that's just wrong. The reason I don't like the cage is that, in my opinion, full cages have absolutely no place whatsoever in any car that's going to be used on the road ever. With the seat in its original lower position, it wasn't as much of a problem. However, I am acutely aware of the fact that if I have a serious accident in this vehicle as it is, there is a chance, if I'm not properly secured, that I will hit my head on this and I will die. That's not a good thing. I'm generally not a fan of that idea. Anybody that has ever been in a car with a full cage with a helmet on and given it a bit of a whack will be able to attest to just how unpleasant it is hitting one of them when you've got head protection. The other major thing that I don't like, and I suspect this is going to be a little bit controversial, is this CAE shifter. It looks stunning, absolutely beautiful, and they are not cheap. They're reasonably popular, but by the time you have actually installed this thing, you'll have spent about a thousand pounds on it. And I just, I just took it as read that it was going to be brilliant, absolutely superb, wonderful. And it's really not. In fact, it's one of my least favorite parts of the car. 
the, the shifting is a bit vague and indistinct. It's far too stiff and it's just, it just knackers your fun a little bit. Now I'm one of these old fuddy-duddy types that kind of subscribes to old ideas about front wheel drive cars. They used to say that you couldn't realistically put anything more than about 200 horsepower through a front wheel drive vehicle. Now granted, we've come up with an awful lot of ways of dealing with higher powered front wheel drive cars. However, when you get in something like this, I do still see why we used to make that old argument. In my mind, anywhere between 250 and 300 horsepower really is as much as a front wheel drive car should ever be asked to deal with. I'm a very big fan of the current Civic Type R and the Hyundai i30N and they're around the 300 horsepower mark. But even those in standard road trim at full weight, if you've got a road surface that's anything other than absolutely bone dry, they are just constantly scrabbling for traction. This has a proper limited slip diff fitted to it as standard and I mean it works, it really really works but even today which is actually pretty dry and reasonably warm for early October the car is just struggling to put the power down and it will spin up easily in second and it will make a damn good go of it in third and it likes to follow the camber and it will try and pull you onto the other side of the road with not much warning. The Momo wheel certainly earns its keep because you need to feel as much as you can through it and the steering feel in this car isn't as great as I would have hoped. It just seems to be oh, lacking, just generally lacking. One thing that is fairly excellent is the suspension. I had absolutely never heard of that company before, but it's proper stuff. Now the Raider setup, as mentioned, is designed to get one 75 kilo person around the Nürburgring. Two observations should be relevant here. One, we're not on the Nürburgring. And two, I'm not 75 kilos. And so you will get the odd little tap where tyre is meeting bodywork for just a second and that does get a little bit frustrating. I personally would have liked them to have dialed in just a, a little bit more leeway. However, that does mean that the ride in this thing is actually remarkably comfortable. Even on these very poor, very difficult British B roads, the car is actually quite composed. On a long journey, one thing which really impressed me with the car was its economy. I don't actually live near any racetrack. The closest is probably Snetterton, which is a good hour and a half away. So I'm realistically on any track day spending more time driving to the track than driving around the track. And that's when things like fuel economy and general comfort really come into their own. The M3 was significantly more comfortable and refined than this on a long journey, however it also had a fairly serious thirst. This thoroughly impressed on the way home from Sweden. At a fairly steady European cruising speed, I was achieving in the region of 40 miles to the gallon. That's pretty amazing. On track, this is going to drink just like anything else. One thing I've learned is that most cars on track tend to drink fairly similar amounts, that is to say, they're all utterly terrible. The car pulls very hard from sort of between about 2.5 to 3,000 RPM, more or less all the way to the red line, but you can feel the torque starting to trail off pretty early on. There is quite a bit of turbo lag, and having the car's ESP in sport mode does help a lot, because otherwise the traction control will just come in far too hard and far too early. quite unusual this for me because ordinarily when I'm reviewing one of my own vehicles I've already had quite a bit of time behind the wheel so I know a lot about it and I feel very well equipped to tell you guys what it's like to live with and so on and so forth. However the fact is I've seen so little of this car and I've driven it 
so little, it, relatively speaking. Okay, I did 900 miles driving home from Sweden, but that was literally a get it home thing. And for the most part, I wound up being a let's limp at home and be really careful type thing. So unfortunately, my ownership experience of this car hasn't been particularly great. That being said, despite the fact that it is just a Megane, the car actually seems to attract a hell of a lot of attention. I drove it home yesterday at about the same time as all the schools were chucking out and predictably all the young lads were sat there going, Rev it mister, rev it! And uh, even just today I had a couple of kids that are about, about yay old, they weren't old at all, and they looked at it and they went, Mummy, Mummy, it's the race car! So, you know, there's that I suppose, I mean let's face it, the approval of five year old boys is very very important when you're thinking about buying a serious car. I know that its new owner is concerned about the car's ability to do long journeys, but in many ways it is actually quite like a Lotus Elise. Those are actually far more comfortable than people ever give them credit for, but they are very noisy cars and, and this is much the same. The AC is one of the few things which is still in the car and it does generally work, but it's a noisy place to be and so what tires you and wears you out is that constant bombardment of road noise and engine noise and everything and it just it grates after not that long so for big long journeys in something like this headphones or something like that are an absolute must driving a car like this also raises the question for me about why on earth people that have things like fiesta sts would ever want to gut their interiors because if you're really that seriously keen about track work you're going to do that i mean and there'd be other cars I would pick anyway for the same price and more to the point you're just making it seriously unpleasant for the rest of the time that you drive it and if like me track work makes up a very very small portion of your driving then gutting an interior just just makes no sense whatsoever if you're keen to follow my M3's exploits, the new owner has an Instagram page. Solo lap this car's registration plate, which is not staying with it. So this car is going to now be transformed into something a bit more ordinary on the registration front. But for a road like this, I mean, it, it pulls hard. And up to about sort of 90 mile an hour or so, it's very quick indeed. On the Autobahn, where this starts kind of slowing down and giving up sort of about 110, 120 mile an hour, that's where the M3 really started to come on song. They're very different cars with, with very different ability levels. Pushing on a little harder, something very unfortunate happens in this and the steering just becomes quite light and the, the feedback actually gets lesser and lesser at lower speeds when you're not pressing on hard it's actually a pretty good a very promising helm and you've got this sort of whole feeling of all oh, this is going to be great when you start moving on and it's going to talk to you in much the same way that the the newer Renault Sport began the 28300 do but sadly it just never does it just it wants to move it's weaving all the time it's following the camber in the road I mean it's very very easy to pick up some serious speed in this thing quite rare in my reviews that I actually wind up traveling this far but this is such an enjoyable road those of you that know it keep it to yourselves but if you do know it you'll know what I mean it's not actually too noisy from outside either I haven't done my drive-bys with this thing yet but it can't be that loud because it's been designed to get on all track days it's noisy in here because it has very little in the way of sound insulation the CAE shifter gets better the more annoyed you get with it. You get really frustrated, you start to move it really, really hard, and then, then it kind of starts to make sense. But as a general rule, I just don't enjoy using it whatsoever. It was kind of funny. I'd been driving this for quite a while, then I got back in the S2000, and I swear I was nearly gonna rip the S2000's gear lever out, such is the difference in effort required between the two. The really sad thing, and I'm, I'm very sorry to disappoint you guys back home, is the fact that I have still not yet driven a normal one of these. This is my only experience in a Mark III RS, is with this thing. I would absolutely love to have a go in one. If you're sat at home with a 250, 265, 275, and you'd like to see it on the channel, please do let me know. I'd really love to review one and see what they're like. And my hope originally was the fact that someone that had one of those, preferably in yellow, 
was going to want to trade theirs in against this and save themselves some considerable money in building a track beast. A lot of other odd things you notice in this, which are, of course, not specific to this car, but the fact that like the, the dials, they're so angled up. Like, I've never known dials to be so disinterested. It's very, very odd indeed. You know, they're all like that. Like, ah, uh, no. It, it's weird. Very weird. The fundamental issue, really, for me with this car is the fact that in, in building it into what it now is, it has been compromised as a hatchback quite completely. And that's a shame because actually, I quite like the idea of this car as a hatchback, as, as a package. I love the look of this generation of Megane. I think they're a really great looking hatch and I'm generally not a hatchback person. I know just being Hayden's just bought himself a yellow one and I am a, a little bit jealous of that. If you haven't seen him, he's a chap up north, does YouTube bits. So if you want to know more about running one of those, I'll go and check him out. His is quite a bit more standard than this and for that reason probably a lot more practical information to be gleaned. The fact of the matter is that nobody in their right mind would ever spend this amount of money on them again. It just, it just wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. So I have to be thankful to Mark for being in, in the wrong mind and, and this car is a great demonstration of somebody sort of going beyond what would be considered reasonable in building a car. As I mentioned, it was his therapy dog. He used it to get through some very, very difficult times. And so in that respect, hopefully it's worth every penny spent on it. It's very, very clear that this car has had a huge amount of love put into it. And it certainly isn't slow, that's for sure. It dances around here. It's so light on its feet, it really is. This is a, a 1,200 kilos in a car with this amount of power. It doesn't have hustle, I can tell you that much and you find yourself kind of being very wary of it because I don't want it to pull me into that side of the road. That would be bad. Woo! This is a lot of fun, this car, when it wants to be. But the problem is, like my M3, when you want it to back off, you want it to be sensible, it can do that. I'm starting to lose my voice now because I've been talking loud so you guys can hear me over this dang thing. And um, <clears throat> that's not enjoyable. That's not enjoyable at all. And unfortunately, the car's just a little too compromised for me to keep. I can't afford to keep doing track days for a little bit, honestly, I'm completely straight with you guys. They're very expensive to do. I think every track day that I did, in reality, probably cost me between four to 600 pounds. And at the present time, I'm just not earning enough off YouTube to do that. As soon as I can afford to do more track days, I definitely will. But for now, I'm gonna enjoy my road cars, keep making videos, I want to thank you all for watching this, sticking with me. We've got some fantastic content coming out soon. I've been really grateful for all your messages of support as we march towards that 50K mark, which is unreal. Maybe we'll have even hit it by the time you see this video. Who knows? Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already. And if we're lucky, if we're really lucky, Hopefully the car's near owner Christian will be able to enjoy this car as intended. He'll get it on track and maybe if I'm super lucky, I will be able to make a video with it in future when it's not my car, showing you it in its real natural environment on track. For now, thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.